We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 is our theme verse for this series. And it says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So what? Run to win, right? That's where the whole series comes from. We know that God's word calls us, those of us in this room who are believers, we're called to run our race of life in a healthy way, in a good way, in, in a way as such as to, to win the prize. And so in this series, we've been looking at different types of health. And today specifically, one of the things I love about God's word is it's not, sometimes we look at the Bible and we look at it as like this theological book of doctrine and you got to like go to seminary to understand what, the, no. Like there are some things that are tough to understand, but the, God's word is incredibly practical. It's for you and I to open up and spend time in here. And when we do that, we find very practical truths for everyday life. And one way that we're going to see a lot of truth in God's word today is in the area of our finances. How can we be healthy financially according to God's word? So I hope you're ready for a very practical message today. I hope you're ready to get your toes stepped on a little bit today because all of us have a lot of work to do in a lot of these areas, all right? Before I get into uh, our, our, the meat of our message, I want to lay a few foundational truths for you. The first one I want to make sure we all know when it comes to finances is that the Bible teaches is that everything is God's. Say that with me. Everything is is God's. Everything in your bank account, everything in your savings account, retirement account, everything you've used uh, money to buy and the, the stuff you have, your time, your talents, your body, everything. We believe that God's word teaches that all of it is God's. And so the things that you have, they're not really yours. You're just the, the temporary steward over them. You're the manager of God's resources for the time being. And so we have to understand that going into this message. The second thing I want to make sure we all understand is that God and faithfulness to God must come first. Before we want to pursue any sort of financial gain or wealth or even health financially, we have to understand the most important thing is to focus first and foremost on God and honoring his, his will for our lives, being uh, faithful to what he's calling us to. That's more important there's a couple of verses that highlight that in Proverbs 16, verse 16, it says, how much better to get wisdom than gold and good judgment than silver. In other words, it's better to pursue the wisdom that God has for us in his word than it is to run after gold and silver. How about Matthew 6, it says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. In other words, first and foremost, focus on God and godliness. Focus on your spiritual health, and he'll provide uh, the pathway towards health in all those other areas. So God comes first, all right? Here, here's a, a third foundational truth I want to make sure we all grab, is that financial health is not equal to financial wealth. A lot of people will confuse these concepts. I'm not saying, hey everybody, listen up. Here's the path to financial wealth. I'm saying here's the path to financial health. And these are not the same thing, right? You can have uh, a ton of money in the bank and really not be financially healthy. You can also have not a ton of money in the bank and be in a place where your finances are very healthy and God honoring. So we're going to pursue those, and I just want to make sure we don't misconstrue my words today. Uh, those are two different things. And, you know, there's a great example of that. There's a guy, his name was Mel Fisher, um, and he decided uh, by himself he wanted to, to find this treasure 
that was rumored to, the ship that was rumored to have gone underwater off the coast of Florida. And so this guy, Mel, he decided to make it his life's mission to find this boat and to pull up the treasure that was on that boat. And he dedicated his life to this goal. In fact, eventually, uh, he found it. He, he, they pulled this boat up, and he found $400 million worth of gold. Now, can we all agree that that would be a good definition of financial wealth? Right? He now has access to a half a billion dollars. But what you don't know as you look at his story is that his, in the process, he lost his marriage. He lost a son. His, his, his life was basically destroyed as he pursued this wealth. And so there's an example of someone who's got a ton of money, but was not in a financially healthy place. And so there, there's a difference Right? In Proverbs uh, 23, verse 4, it says, Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. You see, God wants you to be financially healthy. He doesn't necessarily want you to be financially wealthy. Uh, some of us will be wealthy. Some of us will, will, will not be some people he might ask to, to, to sacrifice pretty much everything that comes in. He's asking you to send it right out. And there's never going to be a ton piling up somewhere. But you can still be financially healthy in the midst of that. All right? A fourth foundational truth I want to make sure we all know is we need to learn with our finances to let go and let God. Will you say that with me? Let go and let God. Why do we let go? Because it's not ours. If we believe that everything uh, that we have financially is God's, all the stuff we have is God's, and uh, that God is able and, and capable of overcoming any uh, you know, adversity that we experience in our finances, then why in the world would we want to hang on to it? You know what happens when you're hanging on, when you're worrying or you're anxious about something, what you're really doing is claiming in that area of your life to be God. Like, I'm responsible for this area. I've got to make this work. I've got to make this happen. And, and you're really playing God in that area. And so what we need to do is let go and let God do what only God can do. God owns it all. He has unlimited resources. So why in the world would we worry about whether or not he wants to provide for his children? Now, that doesn't mean we're off the hook and we don't have to do anything. And so that's what I want to talk about today. God says, listen, don't worry about it. I want you to, to work uh, to, to focus on some things that you can do to bring some wealth, and not wealth, but health into your, your life. Uh, but once you're doing those things, leave the rest to me. Don't worry about it. And so what are the things that he wants us to do? I'm going to give you a little bit of a quiz this morning. If you've been at the last three weeks of this series, you should be able to answer this question. There are four things that in every area of health we need to learn how to do, right? I'll give you the first one so you know what list I'm looking for. The first one is we're going to put good stuff in, all right? Who, who can give me the second one? Keep junk, out. Keep junk out, that's right. The third one, exercise. exercise. And the fourth one, be careful, all right? So we're going to look at our financial situation from those four perspectives, right? We want to put good stuff into our financial situation. We want to keep junk out of our financial portfolio and situation. We want to exercise our money in a way that honors God, and we want to be careful with what he's given to us. And God's word is so full of practical wisdom in these areas that we're going to be flipping all over the Bible today. We've got a lot of verses to cover, all right? So the first one we're going to look at, some practical wisdom when it comes to putting good stuff in. How do we put good stuff into our financial situation, all right? Think about it this way. We need to have a healthy and God-honoring plan to make sure money is coming in to provide for our needs and the needs of those that we've been asked to care for. We need to make sure that we're, uh, if you're financially healthy, you have the resources to be able to take care of yourself and to take care of others. And there's, that can come from different sources, but we need to figure out how do we put good stuff in. Here's the first thing, letter A in your notes is we need to work hard to provide for your family. First thing you need to do is you need to work hard. And now listen, if you're capable of working hard, you need to work hard. The Bible says that uh, true religion, it says in James chapter 1, that true religion is, is a caring, looking after of orphans and widows. Why are orphans and widows mentioned? 
Because they're in a situation where they can't care for themselves. An orphan isn't in a place where they can provide for their own income. A a widow might be in a place where she can't provide for her own income. Uh, But the rest of us, the Bible says that we ought to, if we're, if we're physically able, we ought to provide for ourselves. We need to work hard and, and do that for such a reason as to be able to provide some financial health in our lives. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. That's a gut punch if I've ever read one right there. The Bible says that if you are capable of providing an income for yourself and the family around you, and you refuse to do it, that you are worse than an unbeliever. I want you to to know, when it comes to work, a lot of us are confused. We see work as a bad thing. We, we see work as something that, that must have come as a result of the fall, right? Adam and Eve are in the garden. They eat from the fruit tree they're not supposed to eat from. And God comes. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. Now you're going to have to work. That's not what happened, you know? Adam and Eve had work to do before the fall. And believe it or not, one day you're going to be in the new heaven and the new earth if you're a follower of Christ. And guess what God's going to give you? He's going to give you some work to do. We're going to have work. Work's not a bad thing. The punishment from the fall was that work will now be laborious. It'll be hard and it will be cause, you know, frustration and stress. You, guess what? Young people, you might not like your job. <laughs> There's no promise in the Bible that work is supposed to be fun for you. And that if, the, if your job isn't meet all your needs and bring a smile to your face, that you deserve something else. The Bible actually says that work is going to be tough. And if you are lucky enough to find that job that is just in your sweet spot, I believe I've found it, right? Where I just love what I do for a living. If you can find that, praise God. But you might be in a season where you don't know what that is. You're having a hard time finding it or the job you want, no one's giving it to you. Well, get another job. A job you don't enjoy all that much. Because you need to provide for your family. You need to work hard to provide for your family. Proverbs 10, verse 4, puts it really plainly. You ready for this? It says, lazy people are soon poor. Hard workers get rich. By the way, the word that we're we're using here for, for get rich can easily be translated into financially healthy. So try to be the best you can be in whatever job God has given to you. If you're capable of working and you don't have a job, go get one. Work hard at it. Do the work that God's called you to do as as if unto the Lord. And do it as if to glorify him because he wants you to be financially healthy. Here's a second letter in, in this first category. We need to make sacrifices. You need to make sacrifices. I love in Proverbs verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 13, it gives us an incredible example of a sacrifice that we're going to have to make if we want to be financially healthy. Check this out. It says, if you love sleep, let's pause right there. I know there's a reason you guys didn't come to 815 service, <laughs> right? How many of you are like me and there's just mornings where you're like, I really don't want to get out of this bed today. I love it. It's too cozy. It's raining outside. I love sleep. And for us, I love this verse because it's an example of a comfort, right? We like to be comfortable. Work is oftentimes uncomfortable. Getting out of bed, moving along, getting stuff done. We don't want to do that. We want to just relax. And the Bible says, listen, you're going to have to make sacrifices if you want to put good stuff into your financial story. You're going to have to give up some things that you enjoy doing. That sleep that you really love, it says, if you love sleep, you will end in poverty. But keep your eyes open and there will be plenty to eat. Now, this verse isn't saying that you shouldn't sleep, that there's no need for rest. We understand that there's, God tells us to rest, but we look at the, the ratio of rest to work. And he's wanting you to work more than you rest. We need to work hard. We need to make sacrifices. The letter C is diversify your income. I love how practical the Bible is here. It gives us a really great example of why we shouldn't have all of our income coming from one source and how dangerous that can be. And it says in Ecclesiastes 11, verse 6, it says, plant your seed in the morning and 
Notice that word? Hey, do, do some work in the morning and keep busy all afternoon. For you don't know if profit will come from one activity or another. Or on a good day, you ready for this? Maybe both. Maybe you'll work hard at one thing and that'll bring some profit and you'll work hard at another thing and that will bring some money in too and you got a double blessing. But for a lot of us, we put all of our eggs in one basket and when that basket falls and those eggs shatter, you're thinking, well, what now? If you want to be financially healthy, we're thinking about what happens if. Do I have a plan? Do I have a, a, an emergency fund? Do I have a, something else I could fall back on? Do I have, like, I have a side hustle that I love. Like I, in, in my, my garage, I like to refinish furniture. Take old furniture and sand it and get it down to wood, stain it, re-poly it. That's what I do on my Fridays. My kids are doing school. I'm out in the garage working. I love it. And I, I've gotten pretty good at it. I could make a living at it. If you guys want me gone, just let me know, right? I'll, I'll refinish furniture. But it's, it's a backup. It's not a backup plan because I, you know what I mean? It's, it's a, an additional source of income just in case. And so it's a good, good thing. It's a wise thing to diversify your income. Here, here's the second letter or second uh, point today is to keep junk out, right? So in your financial situation, we want to make sure we're not putting stuff into our, our ledger that's not supposed to be there. The first one is going to be really tough for a lot of us because we, uh, I, my bet is that a majority of us in this room struggle with this first one. And the Bible says we need to keep this junk out. You ready for it? It's letter A, avoid debt at all costs. Avoid debt at all costs. Avoid debt like it's someone coughing behind you, right? Like just avoid it, like, uh, uh, right? Don't. Don't want debt to be a part of your story. Scripture tells us why we should avoid debt. It says in Proverbs 22, verse 7, Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. In other words, when you are find yourself in a place where you have debt, you got to do whatever it takes to stop the bleeding and then to get better and to let that wound heal, to get yourself out of debt. I've been in debt multiple times in my life for different reasons. And I'll tell you, I'm at a place now where uh, I'm financially healthy in this. I got my own issues in these other areas, all right? Not bragging here, but I don't have, uh, we don't have debt. We, we have a mortgage, all right? So that's debt, but we don't have like all the credit card debt and the medical debt and all that stuff. And when I find myself needing to put something on a credit card for a moment because there's just some, an emergency pops up, man, it stresses me out. Like it's my, becomes my goal. By the end of this month, that's going to be gone because I can't, I don't want that debt. And we got to be able to, to tackle debt that way, do whatever it takes. And one of the best bits of advice I can give you, if you're in this room and you have debt, you need to take Financial Peace University. Am I right, Dan? You need... You need to take Financial Peace University. Financial Peace University, we're offering it again in March. And if you know uh, of debt in your situation right now and you're feeling like you got this weight that you can't get out from under, you can't figure out how to get a hold of your, your debt and how to get out from underneath it, come to Financial Peace University. There is a, a cost associated with buying the book, the materials, but if that's what's keeping you from doing it, just come talk to me and I'll buy it for you, right? I want you to be out of debt. And so come to Financial Peace University. Make it a priority of your year to say, I need to be in Financial Peace University. Maybe you're not in any debt and uh, you found yourself in situations where it kind of comes back and you find yourself constantly. Maybe you're just living paycheck to paycheck. It's not just for people in debt. Everyone in this room, you should take Financial Peace University, okay? That's a, a really good advice. If nothing else today, you need to be part of that. It's gonna teach you biblical principles for getting a hold and handle of your finances. Have you noticed that debt has a way of limiting your, your purposefulness, your usefulness in God's kingdom? There, there's a lot of you in this room that God, if God were to call you to something right now, you would be in a, a place financially, you'd be indebted to a place where you wouldn't be able to act on what God was asking you to do because you owe too many people too much money. And we shouldn't be tied down like that. 
We shouldn't be a slave, a servant to the lender. We should be free from that. And so financial freedom, financial peace, I hope that's something you want to pursue this year if you haven't already done that. Letter B, all right? Keep junk out. Letter B, eliminate excessive and wasteful spending. Eliminate it. My wife and I, we really love watching The Office. Uh, we've watched it uh, many times through on reruns and all that, that good stuff. And there's a scene where one of the main characters, his name's Michael Scott, and he's declaring bankruptcy. He doesn't really know. He's in a really financial situation. It's not good. And his buddy, Oscar, uh, who's really good with numbers, pulls up this chart on his computer. And he says, look, and, look, Michael, I put all your expenses into this chart. And there's three columns. And he says, this first column are all the things that, that you need to spend money on, you know, like food and your rent and things like that. And then the second one over here, these are things that are non-essential, uh, but sometimes good to have. And this third column, and this column's like way off the chart, right? And he's like, these are things that nobody needs ever. <laughs> and so for a lot of us, believe it or not, you look at the way you spend money, and you're spending money on things that nobody needs ever. For some of us, it's an addiction. You know, when that box arrives and you hear th that notification on your phone, that, that thing that you just ordered has arrived, it's like that dopamine hit is exciting. You gotta, every time you walk into a mall, you gotta walk out with something and you're thinking, I don't need anything else. Why am I doing this? You're spending money on things that nobody needs ever. And scripture says, don't do that. In fact, I think it's in Hebrews. Let me see. Uh, yeah, Hebrews 13. Verse 5 says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. Don't fall in love with money. Don't fall in love with all the things that it can buy you. Be satisfied with, your, with what you have. And it'll keep you from wasteful and excessive spending. Listen, I, you know, we harp on certain addictions sometimes. We, we think of like addiction to alcohol, addiction to drugs, addiction to pornography, addiction to things. And we're like, yep, those are all addictions one addiction that often goes un, under the radar, it's like an approved addiction, is spending. And if you have that addiction, there are people that can help you get out from underneath that burden. And you might need help. Tell someone, I need help. I keep spending money on junk I don't need. Here's letter C. Reject income that dishonors God. If right now you have a source of income coming into your life and you know that the source of that money, uh, what you have to do to earn that money, uh, wh whatever is involved in, in the trade for that, well, I don't know. But if you have a source of income that dishonors God's word, quit today. You don't owe anybody nothing. Get away from it and trust God to bless you as you seek to earn an income and a living in a way that honors him and pursues uh, his good plan and purpose for your life. There's a verse that backs that up in Proverbs 10, It says, the blessing of the Lord makes a person rich. Again, that can be translated. It makes a person financially healthy. When God has his hand of blessing on your financial situation, you will find yourself financially healthy. But when you're pursuing income that dishonors God, it's, it's a different story, right? It goes on and says, he adds no sorrow with it. All right, here, here's a fourth little bit of wisdom, I think, when it comes to keeping junk out. The Bible says, letter D, to avoid get-rich schemes. Avoid them. This, again, is super practical. One of the reasons I just love God's Word so much, how practical it is, it tells us to avoid get-rich schemes. Proverbs 13, verse 11 says, Wealth from get-rich schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. A couple of stories. There's a, one story of a man who won $2 million after taxes on a lottery scratch-off, right? He got a lottery ticket, scratched that bad boy off. Overnight, you know, the two million was the take home, you know, not the, the taxes, after taxes. He just got, he's a millionaire overnight, right? And within two years, the money was all gone, completely wasteful spending. His wife had left him and his children no longer talked to him. I remember watching, it was like a documentary. Uh, listen, when you get money 
quickly without working hard, learning the value of money, learning how to care for it and pr- properly uh, love with it and, and do what God wants you to with it. Sometimes when it just comes in all at once, it can be very dangerous according to God's word. So work hard to earn a living. And sometimes, by the way, those get rich schemes, they, somebody comes to you with an offer that seems too good to be true, right? It usually is. I remember right after college, my wife and I were newlyweds and I had kind of a basic job and I was looking for some extra income and I wasn't really satisfied with what I had. And I was in Walmart and some guy came up to me and just started commenting about something in my cart. Oh, you know, that cheese, do you like that cheese? I'm like, yeah, I love this cheese. You know, we're, we're talking. And before I know it, I mean, he wasn't really interested in my cheese, right? He just wanted to start up a conversation with me. Before I knew it, he said, well, there's something really exciting in you. I, I think you could be a part of my business. I'm like, wow, I could be part of your business? I'm like, this guy barely knows me. He's invited me to be a partner in his business. Before I know it, I'm in a hotel lobby, you know, later that evening. And I, I've bought into some a multi-level marketing scheme. And six months later, I've like destroyed many areas of my life. Like, what was that about? The Bible says, listen, be careful when it comes to people who are offering you an opportunity to get rich quick. It's probably not true, and it's probably not healthy for you. All right, number three, right? Put good stuff in, keep junk out. Our third level, uh, bit of advice, real practical, right, is to exercise. How do we put our money to work in a way that honors what God would have us do with it? Why? Does God give us the money he gives us because he wants us not to just hang on to it and hoard it. He wants us to exercise it. He wants us to put it out there and to do something with it. So what does God's word tell us to do with what he's given to us? That's what we're going to explore now, all right? The first letter is simply put first things first. If you believe that everything that you have is God's, then obviously you're going to want to do with it what God has asked you to do with it. What God has prescribed for you to do with his money is probably the path you should follow. And when we put first thing first, what we are saying saying simply is, God, I want to do the very first thing you want me to do with my income uh, that you've asked me to do because I know it's all yours. Let's look at this in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. It says, should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. You see, what God's word is saying here is the very first thing you should do with God's money that he's put you in charge of is recognize, God, I believe that this money that is in my account or is in my hand or on this check, I believe that it's yours. And in order to make sure you know I know that it's yours, I'm going to do the very first thing you ask me to do with it. Before Before I save up for this trip, before I try to get out of this debt, before I try to pay this bill, even before I give Uncle Sam his share of it, I want to first do what you've asked me to do with it, which is simply, it's called a tithe, which means a tenth. I'm going to give 10% of what comes in from you back to you very first to say, God, I know that this is yours. And here's the way you know, my, my wife and I have faithfully tithed for, for pretty much most of our marriage. Uh, I've learned, and if you ask anybody who tithes, they will, they will back this up, that what God can do with 90% of your income, with his blessing attached to it, is so much more fruitful than what you can do with 100% of your income with God's blessing withheld from it. You might think, well, I I really need that extra money. I need that dollar for every $10 that comes in. Well, listen, do you believe that God can do more with the 90% and his hand of blessing on it than you're able to do without his blessing? It's an act of faith. It's an act of worship. And God says, listen, if you want to be financially healthy, there's there's a trick to it. You trust me. You put me to the test and see if I don't pour out a blessing so big 
that you can't deny that I was me working in your life. It's powerful stuff. And by the way, I want you to know that some of you might be first time guests here today. You're thinking, I knew it. Here's a church. Church is going to talk about money. We don't talk about money that much. But I want you to know that when we do talk about money, it's not because the church wants something from you. It's because we want something for you. The pastors of this church, the elders and overseers of this church, the the leaders of this church, we know the blessing that God has poured out on our lives because of when when we're faithful to tithe, we want others to be able to experience that. We want something for you. All right, letter B, how to exercise your money, right? Use money to accomplish God's plan for your life. The money that God has entrusted you with, use that to fulfill the good purpose and plan he has for you. Now, this next passage I'm going to put up on the screen is so full of so much good stuff. Uh, Take a picture of it. I don't have time to go through it all, right? 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19 says this, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. You see, what does God's word say we ought to do with our money? You gotta use it for the good purpose and plan that God has for you. Part of that is generosity with other people, uh, being able to take part in the, the story that God is writing. He's like, listen, I'm writing an epic story, and you're a character in the story, and you have the ability to allow your financial blessing that I've entrusted to you to invest it and to, to be a part of the story that I'm writing. And it's, it's an incredible story. And so that's the, the, the letter B, to use money to accomplish God's plan for your life. The fourth thing, right, we're talking about, we talk about putting good stuff in, keeping junk out, exercise. The fourth thing is be careful. The Bible gives us some really practical advice here as well. How can we make sure that we're being careful with the money God's given to us? Here's the first one, and probably the most difficult one for many of us in this room. You ready? Letter A, create and stick to a budget. You guys can groan right there, right? Uh, wait, you mean I have to like know like how much money's coming in and how I'm going to spend it and where it's going to go and be real careful about all that? Yes, the Bible actually tells us in Proverbs 27, verse 3, or verse 23, it says, know the state of your flocks and put your heart into caring for your herds. You see, back in the day, your wealth probably would have been measured more by the number of maybe flocks you have in your herd. You're supposed to know how many of them are there. Are they healthy? Are they sick? Which ones need to be sheared? Which ones need to be milked? Which ones, you need to know what you got going on. You need to know what's in your, and so the question I would have for each of us is if I were to ask you right now, do you know how much is in your bank account? Do you know how much debt you have? Some of us were like, you know, that number just keeps growing and I'm afraid to log in to look at it. You don't even know how much debt you're in right now. How about a real practical, do you know how much money you spend on a monthly basis for eating out? Is that a number that you're aware of or does that number just make itself up from month to month as you make decisions to eat out or not? The Bible says that it's better for you, it's gonna be financially healthy for you to create a budget to know the state of your flocks and then to, to care for that and to, to, by the way, you can't just create a budget, you gotta stick to it. You gotta do what the budget says. It's very practical. I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of advice, um, something that my wife and I, you know, and there's, there's a system that you kind of learn in Financial Peace University where you, 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 you earmark certain expenses through an, you put cash in an envelope and uh, when the money for eating out is gone, the money's gone, right? And you know, I can't spend any more money eating out because there's no more money left in that budget line item. Well, my wife and I discovered an app. 
It's not really even an app, it's a bank that is uh, in the form of an app that we switched to about six months ago and it has revolutionized our budgeting. And I'm not gonna, I don't wanna use this platform to promote some, if you have a question, you wanna know what bank it is, come see me, I'll tell you. But it's amazing because it, it helps us, it, basically every envelope has a different checking account and routing number and when an, our, our paycheck comes into our account, I get to divvy it up between the different accounts. And so when I go out to eat, I know which account I'm using. And when that money's gone, my card's gonna decline. My eating out card is empty. It's amazing. It's like eight bucks a month. It's incredible. <laughs> totally changed the way we budget. And if you need a tool like that, if you're thinking, I tried the envelope system, it doesn't work. I've tried, you know, QuickBooks, it doesn't work. I've tried Mint, it doesn't work. Like this thing was the first thing that really worked for us to stick to a budget. And so come see me if you're having a problem with that. I'll, I'll make a recommendation. Letter B, spend wisely. Spend wisely. Let me give you another way to write letter B. All right? If any of you work in the financial side of our government, pay attention please, all right? <laughs> Don't spend more than you make. Don't spend more than you have. That's just a, a really simple be careful because what happens when you have a little bit coming in and you spend more than that, you end up in debt, right? And then you become enslaved to your debt. And before you know it, you're addicted to a certain lifestyle and that debt just keeps rising and rising and rising. It's gonna be very hard to get out of it. Don't spend more than you make. This is kind of an interesting thought, but guess what? You don't have to spend every dollar that comes in either. We'll get to that in a second. Let me read this verse in Luke 14, verse 28. It says, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? The U.S. government would. <laughs> Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. And they would say, there's a person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Here's my point, right? We need to be careful to make sure we're not spending more than we're earning so that we stay out of debt. Letter C, very simply put one word, save. It's a good thing, it's a wise thing to have money in savings. I love this, this verse in Proverbs 6. I love how just simple, the words are, and it's, it's, check it out on the screen. Verse six through eight. It says, take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Isn't that great? Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. What do ants do because they're wise, right? They recognize that there's gonna be a season where there's not a source of food income coming in, and so they need to store some up for a rainy day. And the truth is the same for us. If you wanna be financially healthy, you're gonna to get to a place where you have some money in the savings account. You have some money in a, in a retirement account. That you're, you're making plans for what happens when, what happens if, and you're gonna have a contingency plan. Right? Remember, don't put all your eggs in one basket. It's a good thing to save money. Now, there's a point in which savings turns into hoarding. You want to be careful. You need to save up for what you're going to need and not save up for what no one will ever need, right? Be careful you're not hoarding, but certainly that you're fulfilling the purposes that God has for your life. So save. Speaking of, remember I was saying you don't have to spend every dollar you earn. Proverbs 13, 7 says, some who are poor pretend to be rich. Do you know what those people are called? Like, they're in debt. Those people are in debt, right? They're poor, but they pretend to be rich. Others who are rich, but pretend to be poor. These are people who don't feel like every dollar that comes in, they got to go buy some flashy new thing. But they know how to save, and they know how to be good stewards and reinvest it and be generous with others and use their money in such a way where, listen, I don't need to live like I'm rich just because I'm financially healthy. 
Letter B, one last little bit of advice before we wrap up, is I want to encourage you to be careful with your charity. In other words, we know it's a good thing to be generous, right? God's called us to be generous with our money. But do you know that you're actually, as a steward of God's money, you should be careful how you're being generous and with whom you're being generous. Don't give your money to just anybody that asks. Because there are times where people take advantage of you and maybe even use your generosity to, to, to move forward an agenda that maybe you're not super thrilled about. So we've got to be careful with our charity. There's a verse that's really tough to read. In 2 Thessalonians 3, it says this, Those unwilling to work should not eat. You know what this verse basically means is if there's someone who's capable of earning an income, but they refuse to do it, you might think the most loving thing to do is to buy them lunch. The Bible says it might actually be more loving to get them to a place hungry enough where they're willing to go work for their lunch. Now, I don't know everyone's situation, but here's the point of this scripture is when you're choosing to be generous, when you're choosing to be charitable, when you're choosing to give, be wise and think about what you're doing and make sure it's something that God has put on your heart to do. And whenever the Holy Spirit prompts you to be generous, do that. But just be careful, all right? So uh, one more quiz question. We're at that point in the sermon where we ask what question now? What now, God? Good job. You guys are rocking and rolling today. A plus, right? If you're new to this church, this is the moment where we ask God to guide us into a next step. And if you'd flip over your notes, you're going to see that it says, what now, God, there at the top of the back side of your notes. And I want you to write down something very practical that God is prompting you to do based on the wisdom from his word. Not from my words, but from what God has asked us to consider today. What is it that you need to do to bring financial health into your life or to increase in financial health? Maybe it's getting out of debt. Maybe it's attending Financial Peace University. Maybe it's creating a budget. Maybe it's being careful with something you're spending money on that you shouldn't be. I don't know what it is, but God does. I want you to write that down. So you're accountable to the words uh, that you're writing. And I want to close with that one verse in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. So as you have your what now God sort of thing written down, I love how this verse kind of helps us know what to do with that. He Number one, church, don't worry. Let go and let God. Give it over to God. Secondly, this verse reminds us to talk to God about it. You can let God know, hey, God, this, this is out of control. I don't know how to stop spending. I don't know how to get out of debt. I don't know how to bring in an income. I don't know where my next paycheck's going to come from. God, I don't know. Talk to him about it so you can release it over to him. Let go of it. But then it says, tell God what you need. Pray about it. Say, God, I really need a job that honors you. God, I need a job that, that does, God, I need an income from some source. Or I, I need, I don't know what that conversation needs to look like, but you do. And don't forget the fourth step, which is thanking God for all that you already have. When you go to God and ask for stuff, make sure he also knows how thankful you are for what he's already provided for you, okay? Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the incredibly practical gift that we find in your word. Thank you for the gift of being able to open up to Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the New Testament all over your book that you've given us, you've revealed to us truths about how to be healthy financially. Would you allow us to be a church that is flourishing in our financial health so that we are more capable of making a difference in this community that we are more capable of generosity, that we are more capable of going and doing what you call us to do because there isn't a financial burden weighing us down. Allow us to be a church of, of health in this area. We thank you and we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, 
will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.